Hello, I'm Andrew Kamei Deutsch, and this is Pre-Modern Japan. Today we're going to be looking at one of the most important events of the Kamakura era, namely the Mongol invasions. Now what do walls like this in Kyushu and these strange objects on the bottom here have in common? The answer is that they're both remnants of the Mongol invasions of Japan. These walls were defensive structures that were built by the Japanese to try to even the odds against the large Mongol armies that invaded Japan. Well, on the other hand, these devices are actually explosive shrapnel weapons called Tetsuhao, which were employed by the Mongols when they attacked. And here we have an image in a contemporary scroll of what they looked like being used. Now, who were the Mongols? Well, they were a nomadic people from the steppe north of China, known to be skillful and fast-mounted fighters, and under the leadership of Genghis Khan, a united Mongol Empire began in 1206 and expanded rapidly across Asia. By the early 13th century, they dominated much of Asia through to East Europe. Now, how was it that the Mongols were able to do this, fighting against people from a wide variety of different backgrounds and always overwhelming their opponents? Well, they had a variety of advantages. First of all, they were mounted archers from birth. You might recall I've talked a little bit about mounted archery before and how that was one of the most important skills of the samurai in pre-modern Japan. So it wasn't swordsmanship that mattered so much as skill with the bow. And so mounted archery was considered the elite warrior skill, and in the case of the Mongols, they were raised actually learning how to do this from a very, very young age. So they had an immense advantage over most of their opponents who had to be carefully trained in this skill and lacked that kind of lifelong experience. They also had very fast, strong ponies. The image that we have of pre-modern warriors is often of someone riding on a great steed, but the reality was that it was actually often more helpful to have a smaller, faster type of animal that could move you quickly over great spaces. And in this case, the Mongols had a great advantage. Their ponies could carry a lot of weight, but they could move very quickly. And Mongols would often take several ponies with them on an expedition, so that as soon as one got tired, they could switch to another one and allow the first one to recover. So they could always arrive at the scene of a battle, ready and refreshed to fight. They also used composite bows, so these bows that were made of multiple pieces and had a great amount of flex, much more powerful and reliable than the other conventional bows being used by many people at the time. The Mongols also made use of psychological warfare and intimidation. They were very careful managers of their own reputation. They might attack a town and murder everyone except a few people, and then tell the survivors, go to the next town and tell them what we've done. And of course, those poor stragglers would rush to the next town and tell them, oh my god, the Mongols destroyed everything, they killed everybody. And so as soon as the Mongols showed up on the horizon and said, do you want to think about surrendering? Naturally, the next town would say yes. So, very, very clever type of tactic they would often use to try to frighten and intimidate people through building up this very ferocious reputation. Now, they were also able to live off the land. They learned how to hunt and fish, and they could make almost everything they needed from the natural environment. Therefore, they didn't need to have complicated supply chains, which gave them an advantage over other armies at the time. They were also quite good at adapting weaponry or technology they didn't have from people they conquered. And finally, they were also able to absorb entire armies. Rather than simply taking a huge army prisoner and then massacring everybody, they would often convince them to join them. And then this way they would continue to gain forces as they expanded across new territory. So we can see that the Mongol Empire, an enormous territory that reached all the way from the edge of East Asia here, all the way across into East Europe absolutely astronomical amount of territory, and it was all gained within the span of less than a century. Now, the Mongols managed to conquer North China from the Jurchen Jin in 1234, and they gained control of Korea in 1259, which already gave them control of a large amount of Northeast Asia. 
Genghis' grandson Kublai Khan was really determined to conquer South China, establishing the Yuan Dynasty. During this war, he sent a letter to Japan demanding that it submit. And we have this wonderful expression here on the bottom. Why don't we visit each other and establish a cordial relationship? Who wishes to appeal to arms? Essentially saying, let's be friends, i.e. you should surrender and pay us tribute, and if you don't cooperate, then we're going to send our army. Well, of course, the person reading this letter was Hojo Tokimune, the Hojo regent of Babakufu at the time. In total, Kublai sent five letters to Japan, and Hojo Tokimune simply ignored all of them. He tried very hard to avoid panicking people. In 1274, Kublai's first invasion force, consisting of some 30,000 troops, invaded Japan. The defenders were quite poorly prepared, but they fought very, very hard. They ran into all kinds of problems because of those points that I illustrated about Japanese warriors in our previous talks. So here we have the Mongol army coming in, very, very large, fairly well disciplined, and we have, in contrast, all of these Japanese warriors that have different backgrounds, different types of weaponry, they're not really used to fighting very well together, they have a much more individualistic character than they've often been given credit for. And so when they go to face the Mongol hordes, which are content to simply fill everyone with arrows, then we have samurai crying out, no fair, no fair, but it's simply a very different way of warfare, and they had to learn to adapt to those tactics. So, despite being greatly outnumbered and very poorly prepared, they banded together and fought very hard against the Mongols. Just when it seemed that things were at their worst, a great typhoon arrived and wiped out the invasion fleet. Well, the Bakufu, having survived the first invasion, was not content to simply sit there and do nothing. They decided they had to prepare in case the Mongols tried again. So they built those defensive walls that I mentioned at the start. They brought even non-vassals under Bakufu authority as a way of ensuring that they could rally warriors very quickly during the, in the event of a second invasion. They established a defensive network of warriors and tried to increase information exchange. And they also developed better group tactics and planning so that they could respond to the Mongol forces better. In 1281, the second invasion force arrives with an enormous army of 140,000 troops. A great battle waged for seven weeks, and the Japanese forces refused to give up. Again, just when things seemed that they were at their worst, another storm arrived and wrecked the Mongol fleet. So once again, Japan had been saved. Now, we can see on the bottom here, this is an image taken from a scroll that shows the warrior Takizaki Suenaga charging against the Mongols. Now, this itself is actually a very important artifact because Takizaki Suenaga recorded all of the events that happened to him during the campaign against the Mongols. Therefore, it's a very valuable primary source for telling us about what had transpired. Why was it that Japan was able to win? Well, first of all, they managed to check the enemy advance with those defensive walls I mentioned, which at least would gave them more time to try and defend their positions and respond to the enemy attacks, so it did make a difference. Second, they had learned from the Mongols and tried to work better together against them, so they were able to adapt to Mongol tactics. Third, the Mongol armies were themselves divided. Most of their soldiers were not actually Mongols. They were people that had been recruited from conquered territories. And therefore, they didn't necessarily have that much will to fight. And finally, we have, of course, the typhoons that were responsible for wiping out the ships and preventing the Mongols from continuing their attack. So... Against overwhelming odds, the Japanese warriors had twice managed to defend the country against invasion. However, the Bakufu was unable to pay all of the warriors who had fought. Remember that in the vassalage system that I talked about last time, the lord, i.e. in this case the Bakufu, is responsible for rewarding all of their warriors who fight bravely. 
This is a bit of a problem when you're dealing with a foreign invader because you don't gain any treasure or land from defeating an invader. And so therefore, the Bakufu was unable to adequately reward most of the warriors who had fought for them. Therefore, this actually served to undermine their legitimacy, since it made them look like they were being an unfair lord who had not properly rewarded their followers. The victory of the Bakufu thus also revealed its weaknesses, and it was the inability to reward its vassals that could break the system that it relied upon. Thank you very much.